but and uh, greetings and good morning to all the science chairs. And so I've been asked and uh, tasked to give a, an update on the project. Um, keep in mind that a lot of what I'm about to say is um, pre-COVID. Um, there are a few uh, comments in the uh, presentation about how we're dealing with the COVID at a technical level. I'm going to stay away from the programmatics. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to start off with um, uh, the data management system. And since I, right, um, yeah, there we go. Um, since I know Leanne is on and Jelko's on, uh, they can help me. All right, somebody needs to mute. Yeah, I'm gonna mute. Um, I'm gonna mute everybody that I see is unmuted. Um, I cannot do that, Jelko. This is your call. You, I cannot. Um... Can you say again? Um, I think everybody muted themselves. I don't have yeah. the power. Yeah, to Fred, I think the only one who was not muted was you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> muting myself now. So on the data management side of things, um, over the last quarter or so, uh, there's been a lot of progress. Uh, release 19 is out. Um, there's been a range of uh, key enhancements made, in particular in the uh, area of calibration and de-blending, and also the calculation of uh, different imaging objects and a lot more stuff. But um, uh, and then there's planning that, that Leanne and Will and company are doing for the future releases on um, uh, solar system linking, um, aperture corrections, brighter, fatter effects, et cetera. Um, the figure you see, this is the, the, um, I, I know Will, Will hates this when I, when, I, when I told him this, but this is now what I call the poodle diagram. And so this is a, a, a example of the effectiveness of the deblending algorithms that are now in release 19. So the center panel is um, observations from uh, HSC prime, and then the left panel is the, uh, the model from the deblending algorithm, and then the, the, the right-hand panel is the uh, difference. And you can see it's essentially just noise. So there's been a lot of improvement there and uh, that's pretty exciting to see um, that progressing fairly well. Um, on the calibration side, um, in data management, um, uh, Release 19 now has the um, forward global calibration modeling um, in incorporated, and you can see the difference in um, the processing of HSC prime data um, uh, with, with and without the, uh, the global uh, calibration modeling applied. And clearly um, on the right-hand side panel, um, you can see the tightness, the increased tightness of the locus um, uh, uh, in the stellar photometry. I don't know if Jelko or Leanne want to make any comments on those two charts before I move on. Yeah, Chuck? Uh, yep. Just on the previous slide, you, you said that this showed the performance of the debelt blending algorithms, just to be clear. This shows the performance of the scarlet deblending algorithm, not of, of deblending algorithms in general. And it, it shows how scarlet is well able to deblend uh, close uh, galaxies um, very well. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Leanne. Um, and Leanne, since you ran the um, uh, uh, the next chart is on the uh, the algorithms workshop. I'll let you speak to this chart um, since um, you ran the show. Certainly, happy to help. So, as many of you know, um, in March, the week of the seventeenth of March, we held the Rubin Observatory Algorithms Workshop. Um, as many of you also know, this was originally planned to be an in-person workshop at Princeton. We had about 80 or so people had registered. We were prepared for a very exciting in-person event and very much looking forward to not only the presentations from the project and from the invited speakers, but also to, have, to having a lot of in-person time to discuss with attendees at the workshop, a lot of open discussion. We had planned for our conference sessions, uh, nice long coffee breaks, etc. 
Two weeks before uh, the workshop, however, COVID-19 became a problem and we converted this to an all virtual workshop. This was pretty challenging, but um, I think it was a, a really good success. You can see on the right here some of the feedback from the participants about the project itself, uh, the use of Zoom uh, as a virtual platform. People were very happy with this, the online materials, the quality and the relevance of the project talks. So um, although it was incredibly challenging for everyone, both the uh, organizers and the participants to, to run this across multiple content, continents uh, as a virtual meeting, it was a huge success. At the workshop itself, we discussed primarily the algorithmic challenges faced by Rubin, process, uh, Rubin Observatory, specifically for image processing. So we didn't cover every possible choice of algorithm for everything we're going to do within the pipelines. We focused very strongly on image processing. And specifically, uh, we had talks around photometric and astrometric calibration, PSF estimation, galaxy photometry, de-blending, and crowd, crowded field image processing and image differencing. We considered these to be probably the most, um, the topics that most people would have a lot of interest and in that were, uh, we wanted to really present our algorithmic approach to within the um, LSST science pipelines. Um, we have made the project talks available. We recorded all of the talks and they're available at this link here. You can go to the agenda linked at the website and you can listen to all the, all the talks. I think that this uh, algorithm has provided with a, us with an excellent set of talks and recordings uh, to be used as a reference for the science collaborations going forward. I would say if people want to understand in detail where we're at with the, uh, with the algorithms for image processing, please go to these talks first, listen to them, and then come back with questions. We are now also in the process of organizing some follow-up to this workshop primarily because in the uh, modified or virtual format of the workshop, we were unable to really bring in any substantial unconference style discussion time. And this was, uh, this was unfortunate, but having to cope with a large number of time zones all around the world. And um, as, as many of you know, eight hours a day on Zoom at a workshop is exhausting. So we also wanted to restrict the total number of hours that people were, were on this workshop. So we're looking at how we can organize follow-up now and take feedback from the science collaborations, uh, questions they have, um, and organize follow-up sessions. Um, that's all I have to say. Happy to take questions. Actually, I wanted to add one thing, uh, which is that uh, some of those talks are very relevant for all the science collaborations or a large swath of the science collaborations work. And at the time, I had started contacting some of the speakers to ask them to speak at this very meeting. And so I think we, uh, the next couple of iterations of this meeting uh, will be a good venue to have uh, some versions of those talks presented to us that might be, you know, with slightly different, uh, with a slightly different um, purpose given the slightly different audience. Okay, it would be good to, I'm not close to that idea, it would be good to understand exactly how you would want to repurpose this and, and um, how, how you would like it to be different from the talks that are online already. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We can talk about that. And I will, I will iterate with you and with the speakers that I had identified as the most, sort of the ones that cover the most shared okay. interests. Okay. All right, thanks Leanne for, um, for jumping in on a, on a moment's notice. Um, no uh, further progress in, in uh, the data management arena is um, the development of the Gen 3 data access. I think that's also known as a Gen 3 Butler. Mm -hmm. um, there's been some, you know, rearrangement on uh, personnel that are, are paying attention to it. And I think progress is being made. Um, uh, DM has, um, has done a proof of concept using um, web-based services from Amazon um, for using this middleware and um, it's now being used to process data from several precursor facilities so I think we're getting close to um, having a you know the gen, gen 3 middleware up and running um, for general use but um, I think there's still a little bit more development to go and maybe Leanne may want to comment on that um, as well, so maybe I'll pause. Sure, I think that, that summarizes it well, Chuck. Um, we're, we're working full steam ahead. We recognize that getting Gen 3 out the door is a high priority, uh, given high priority within data management. Um, so, so yes, we're progressing on that. 
Yeah, and so some of this um, this infrastructure stuff, um, we're starting to test it. Um, there's been a, um, a bunch of early effort um, uh, this past year um, on Lattice, and the Lattice is is the acronym for the what is it? The LSST Auxiliary Telescope Imaging Spectrograph System. We'll have to come up with another name for that. But next slide is here. Um, we had a really successful initial, what I would call commissioning run of the Oxtel and its instrument. Um, you see here that um, we had people in Chile on the left-hand side operating in our control room. And then we had quite a few people in Tucson um, on the right-hand panel in our uh, remote control uh, room um, uh, supporting this 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 work, and this is um, as far as data management goes. Um, you know this this is now exercising, you know the pipeline or the the not the pipeline but the um, the data transfer and the the ability to, to to move data from Chile to NCSA and to process it um, on site at NCSA. And I will also add to this um, chart that. At this time, we also had support coming from the uh, UK and from, I think we had support coming from Princeton and we also had support coming from UW. So during this run, we had you know many different sites um, tuning in and, and participating in um, the acquisition and evaluation and the processing of the data. So I think, you know, Oxtel is starting to serve its purpose as a pathfinder. And I think this was a really great exercise for us to have gotten through. So I will pause briefly there if there's any questions for Leanne on the data management side. Otherwise, I'm going to go to the telescope and site summary. Okay, hearing nothing. Telescope and site. Then perhaps I have a question um, if you can um, briefly. Um, referring to the Scarlet D Blender, is there a corresponding improvement in the ability of the D Blender to uh, perform on crowded fields, crowded star fields? The Poodle plot was specifically, it looked at least to me like it was specifically extra galactic, right? The Poodle plot did, is extra galactic, yes. Um, I'm not sure. I have to go back and see if there's any plots. Um, Thank you. If there are, it would actually it would be in the algorithms workshop talk. I'll follow up and get back to you on that. Thanks. Okay, so um, proceeding on um, telescope and site. So prior to the COVID nineteen um, thing, which I'll get to at the end of this um, sub presentation, um, the focus had been on advancing the dome work and. The, the emphasis was trying to get as much cladding and covering onto the dome as possible. As you know, and I'm, I'm sure everyone on this call has, has heard that the progress in the dome has been considerably slower than we had um, have desired, but um, things did, were progressing well until the, the COVID shutdown occurred. So. Um, the project has done, I think, an extraordinary job of um, navigating some of the difficulties here. For example, um, some of the subcontracts of the dome contractor, uh, we, have, we, the project, the construction project, have taken over directly uh, to relieve the prime contractor of um, that burden. Um, so it's still slower than what we want. Um, there are still some financial issues with the main contractor, but um, the project is, even now in the COVID-19 shutdown era, uh, it is still has our undivided attention to um, work with the contractor and so that when we do restart, that we um, do so in a very efficient way. Um, I will say that we're, we are entering into, into uh, the Chilean winter, 
And so that's going to limit um, the ramp up of how that work gets restarted. I'll have more to say about that later. But uh, progress was made. So we got um, you know quite a bit of cladding onto the dome itself. We got the um, uh, the provisional crane, which is that upper right hand panel with that orange bar going across. Um, the the final crane is still in in Italy, awaiting for the re resumption of work so that it can get delivered and installed. Um, at the same time, um, we had started work on the telescope mount assembly. Um, and so it started with the installation of the azimuth tracks, which you see on the lower left is the installation of those tracks onto the top of the, uh, the uh, mount pier um, up on the uh, summit site. And then the uh, the panoramic view up in the upper right shows the progress that was being made uh, just prior to the shutdown, getting the um, the two gray pieces, the one in the foreground and the one in the background, are the the um, supports for the elevation axis, and that yellow structure in the middle is the uh, surrogate mass for the um, M1 M3. Uh, mirror cell system, and you can see in the far upper right that surrogate mass being lifted and lowered into uh, the dome. So um, we were at the time working really hard to operate and, and integrate these things in parallel between the TMA, the telescope mount assembly, and the dome. And that did present some logistical challenges for us, but I think we've done a reasonable job in making progress on that. Um, lower left, you can see one of the big pieces of the, um, the telescope mount assembly being transported up uh, to the mountain. So um, prior to the COVID-19, uh, the TMA team was operating um, ahead of their schedule. And again, as part of our uh, planning uh, going forward, we are in active engagement with the, um, the Spanish team on um, how to efficiently restart this work. But um, you know, the once I, I believe once we get restarted again, uh, the trajectory will be uh, pretty darn good. Um, more pictures of the uh, telescope mount assembly being installed into the dome facility. Um, I will say that. Uh, one of the things we did accomplish um, prior to the COVID thing was we managed to get all of our heavy lift um, operations completed. So that massive crane you see in the um, uh, right-hand panel there, that's now been disassembled. And um, the, the company that runs that crane has another contract and it's been relocated and so when we resume operation um, we won't need this 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 scale of crane anymore but um, we will we'll still need to bring on uh, some new cranes on site to, to to complete the work but the the big heavy lifting of for the tma installation has been completed so that that's that's a good milestone for us to check off um, on other topics, inside the summit facility, there's this, what we call level three in the summit facility. And level three is the, the sort of the operational maintenance area. And that's where we have the coating chamber, the washing, washing station. And there we've been doing, a, uh, using that space to do a lot of testing. Here you see um, uh, the, mirror, the M1, M3 mirror cell being test fitted against the uh, coating chamber, that's the center image. And then um, there's been a lot of testing on uh, the positioning of the magnetrons that are used to lay down the coating. Uh, the washing station has been tested and um, the whole M1, M3 mirror system has been um, functionally tested um, 
uh, with its control system. So that that's moved along well. Um, just bef again, just before the COVID shutdown, we we had the um, the the coding system contractor come back out from Germany and work with us to do a a full scale um, prototype run for the M1 M3 aluminum coating, and that was generally successful. I think you know functionally it went well. Um, the performance of the coating, we're still investigating it. it. It met spec in some places and missed spec in some other places, but not by much. And so we're, we'll be working on that in the interim here to figure out what improvements and what additional tests we need to do once we restart. Um, software systems on the telescope and site um, continue to improve. Um, we have, you know, uh, the system abstraction layer um, that you may have heard about. Uh, we have a, a stable release now that's fully implemented. It's being deployed um, across the entire suite of subsystems. I'll get to that in a moment here in, in its use to uh, facilitate system integration and test. But um, uh, it's an ongoing effort since some of the, so the, the issue that we are, we are facing is that uh, some of the software that were, was developed by vendors was um, developed with a previous version of the uh, software abstraction layer. And so these, these uh, software deliverables that we now own, right, this, the, the vendors are no longer involved. Um, we are having to update those to current versions of our software. And that that's, continues to go on. The first round of that was uh, the Hexapod Rotator, um, and that was largely successful. And, you know, as we bring each subsystem online, these software updates will continue. Um, at the base facility, um, the, uh, the new office complex, uh, that we uh, were constructing in La Serena is now complete. Um, it is now being occupied by the uh, Chilean LSST team. Uh, the data center, you see that in the lower left, is also, you know, as far as construction goes, it's complete and ready to receive the equipment from uh, to, to form the data center. And already we already have a number of servers in that facility. And in, in my own personal interest, we have all the servers in place for what we call the, the commissioning compute cluster. So the commissioning, the compute power needed for commissioning is in place. And I think if I, if I understand what I did yesterday, I, I tested out the LSST science platform, or I, get, I should just call it the science platform for now. Um, uh, uh, the base version of the science platform operating on that cluster. And so um, we are getting ourselves ready to be able to uh, process data directly um, on that cluster in, in La Serena. So that's, that's a good, um, good, good milestone progress. So, Essentially, the, the, the office complex in, uh, as far as the construction project goes, in terms of the, the civil construction, it's done. And uh, it's ready to be uh, outfitted with all the infrastructure needed to support the data processing. Um, el elsewhere, um, again, this is all prior to COVID, or uh, the COVID, sorry. Um, uh, we are working in Tucson on a variety of things. Uh, you see the, the fan coil units up in the upper left for the M1 M3 system. As you all know that the work in Tucson um, was shut down, but we are now starting to plan for a restart so where a small number of people can, can uh, go into the shop. Those that actually have to do things you know, physically on physical hardware will be the first to go in. 
Um, and I think we got through all of the testing of the fan coil units. Uh, the lower uh, right, you see the uh, fabrication of the uh, ComCam integrating structure. Um, I'll get to that in a moment. That's pretty much done now. And then there was uh, working on the software integration for the our Shack Hartman wavefront sensing. Um, as you all know that the summit was shut down on March 20th. And so I just, this is just a, a montage of what the state of the summit is in now. Uh, we've given that winter is on, on its way. We've tried to protect as many exposed elements or systems as we possibly can. Um, in addition, um, even during the shutdown, we are sending very small crews um, up to the summit with very specific tasks. And these are mainly to um, maintain the hardware um, throughout the winter months because we suspect that um, the resumption of, a full resumption of, of operations up on the summit won't occur until after the, the winter has passed. I think this is my last slide on telescope and sight, so maybe I'll pause there and see if there's questions related to the telescope. I have a couple. If nobody else, um, if you have any questions, uh, a reminder, please put them in the chat. Um, my questions about the dome. If I remember correctly, one of the things that was said was that it was a blessing that the company in Italy that was not able to deliver what they were contracted to deliver was, however, not bankrupted because that allowed um, communication about what they had done and exchange of information and exchange of expertise. And I'm wondering how they're doing now after COVID and if there's going to be more problems um, obtaining um, information from the company and related um, if the software is going to have to be uh, reworked after the dome passes hands. Uh, I did I oh so um, in this chart here I forgot to mention that one of the silver linings of this slowdown is that it's given the the vendor more time on the software side of things. And so they've made a lot of progress. So what they've done in Italy is they've they've set up essentially a, a working uh, prototype, if you will, um, of the motors and the controllers, and that's allowed them to develop their software um, more fully than, than we would have gotten otherwise. Okay. So, um, and, and regarding the, the exchange of information, no, I, I don't think there's, I don't think this, this, the, the current situation has affected that up at all. I think it may have actually improved it in some ways. That's some silver lining of COVID for you. Uh, and I had another question, which is that Chile is going through a second wave um, of like a rising in the cases and a second tightening of the social distancing rule though, right? So is that affecting traveling to the to the mountain and the ability to send small groups? So I don't know the full story, Fed, on that. I, I do know that um, there's been an additional tightening of social distancing uh, rules in, in particular in Santiago. Right. Um, it has not yet affected our ability to send our limited teams. Um, you know, we, we are we, we have small number of people, um, typically like five to seven people once a week are going up to the summit. We put them um, two per person or two, two per vehicle, mm -hmm. one in the front, one in the back. Um, and we, we're doing everything we can to make sure our people are kept safe. Right now, our ability to get up to the summit in this limited fashion has not yet been affected by the additional um, restrictions in Chile. Thank you. 
So moving on to the camera progress, um, uh, the summary on the optics, I'll, I won't go through every single item here, but just um, the, the, the main point is that the camera team at Slack has received all the major optical components um, that go into the camera with the exception of the filters. The filters Chuck, are still... Sorry to interrupt. I don't know so, if it's my problem, but I only see a part of your slide. Does everybody see the full slide? Is it me? I see everything. Okay. Yeah, me too. You might need to close the chat window. No, it's uh, the Zoom is somehow weird on my window. But carry on, please. Okay. Um, so, uh, all, all the uh, the major optical elements, L1, L2, which is the upper left, L3, which is the lower left, have all been received and accepted uh, uh, with their performance specifications. Um, there had been some uh, challenges with the uh, filter coding metrology system that is being uh, developed. Uh, to make sure that we have full knowledge of the coding performances. But uh, prior or after this slide was created, um, uh, we've learned from the vendor that they've made a lot of progress on that system. And so we're expecting that um, we, we will end up with, from the vendor, full mapping of the bandpass performance across the entire filters for each filter that are produced. And so if I remember correctly, the R-band filter is done and being measured. The I-band filter, I also think, is done in a weighting measurement. And I think the Y-band, Y or Z, it's one of those two. Y or Z is midway through its coding process. And so uh, the good news here is that the uh, coding vendor for the filters is they haven't shut down. They're, they're, for probably other reasons beyond Rubin Observatory, they are deemed as an essential business and have kept operating. Um, at Slack, prior to the shutdown, um, the, the cryostat refrigeration and utility trunk effort is was nearly complete. Um, of course, this is all in preparation for their um, their system integration and test, and um, that should be uh, well. I, I actually have a, a chart here coming up, but um, work is gradually uh, starting to resume at Slack. So, um, but technically, the, the 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 bits and pieces that all go into these systems that are part of the camera, they're pretty much done, and um, they just need to be um, installed and and integrated into the integration test um, effort. Further progress at Slack. Um, uh, again, this is all prior to COVID, but um, the left panel shows the integration of the filter exchange mechanism into the um, uh, camera main body. And, and that's pretty, that was a, that's a big deal because what that meant was that um, the filter exchange mechanism was was built and developed at IN2P3 in France, and so that was tested there and accepted and shipped and delivered and re-verified at Slack, and so that's ready now to be a first article um, piece of the camera and um, is part of the integration. Um, also, uh, another good milestone for the camera team was that um, the uh, the shutter, uh, the big shutter that goes inside the camera. Um, it, you might remember um, there there are two shutters. Um, these are are meant to be swapped out um, annually um, to maintain performance. Um, shutter number one was delivered at the time of the making of this chart, and I prior at post this chart, um, I've learned that shutter number two has been delivered. So we have two operating shutters now um, for the camera. 
and um, those are now being uh, integrated into the uh, the, the main uh, camera system. And the, the center um, uh, image is a heat map of the flatness of the uh, focal plane. So um, in the next slide, I have a, a picture of the full focal plane showing uh, it is now completely integrated, which is excellent. And um, this just shows that the, the flatness specs um, that uh, of that in fully integrated focal plane uh, are meeting uh, its requirements. So, um, just prior to the uh, COVID shutdown, the camera team was just ramping up uh, on their integration and test. You see the central image, that's the full focal plane, fully integrated of 189 science sensors and four corner rafts with the guiders and wavefront sensors. Um, they got one of the shutters installed into the camera body, and then um, there are uh, they've been also been, uh, testing the um, the exchange process. So you know, as you know, that they're inside the camera, there's five out of the six filters, and in, in that the the operational plan is that you know synchronized with the lunation that we would swap out the U band filter for one of the the redder filters, either Z or Y, and that mechanism on the lower lower right is the the mechanism that would be used to um, make that exchange um, uh, automated. So as I mentioned, uh, you know, Slack pretty much shut down completely, um, but as of this week, and I think last week. Um, Slack is starting to allow some limited operation, and so the status there is that um, uh, the uh, uh, in the IR2 lab, which is where all this this integration um, activity is happening, they're allowing one person in there at a time, and they're what they're doing right now is prepping uh, the refrigeration system to restart. And they expect to hopefully start cooling down the camera again next week. Sorry. That's good news. Yes, ma'am. Someone is typing. Can whoever is typing vigorously mute himself or herself? Thank you. Fed, I think you're muted, Fed. Sorry, I was uh, making the same comment as Jelko. Yeah, uh, Jelko, you also should be able to mute people because it's your call. Nope, it doesn't let me. I don't know why. Never mind. Sorry, I think Dion Slack as well about that. Please carry so, on. Okay, so so that was my summary on the camera status. If there's questions on that, I can I'll pause and then otherwise I'll move on to the status of system integration and test. Okay, hearing nothing. SITCOM, System Integration Test Commissioning. Um, again, uh, we've been we've been really busy. We've made a lot of progress, um, in, even in spite of uh, COVID. Um, we've gotten uh, the DIM, the Differential Image Motion Monitor, uh, which is our sightseeing monitor. That's installed and operational. The Oxtel spectrograph has completed its work in Tucson. It's been shipped and installed and commissioning has begun. Uh, ComCam, you'll see later that ComCam is essentially, uh, it's essentially done um, with the exception of integrating it into its um, structure that will be used to support it on the telescope. Uh, the refrigeration pathfinder infrastructure has all been delivered um, to Chile, and we're just really waiting for things to restart to get that um, work underway. And then um, uh, just at the end of uh, calendar 2019, um, seems like a, such a long time ago, um, we had a really nice um, 
uh, one of our first system integration exercises with the camera cable wrap and the hex pod rotator on the cart. And there'll be some charts that, that show that. So uh, the DIM, it's installed, it's on its tower over on Calibration Hill. Um, it's a fully automated system. Brian Stalder has been instrumental in making all that happen. It really is a, um, it has turned out to be a really nice instrument where it really is a, you know, you basically push the green button and say go, and um, the software and the systems take over for the rest of the night with no no human intervention involved. So that what's, um, unfortunately, um, it's not in regular operation right now, given the current situation, but um, once we get going again, uh, this will be the first time we've had uh, sightseeing measurements on the LSST site in more than a decade. So we we took down our original sightseeing monitors in preparation for the civil construction uh, for the summit facility and the other uh, facilities. The Oxtel has been uh, fully integrated and is generally functional. That's the center set of panels. Uh, Patrick Ingraham has been working uh, diligently to get that up and running. Um, and um, and it's also serving as a very useful platform for debugging and developing our control software since the, um, the um, interface architecture for Oxtel is going to be the same as the interface architecture for uh, the main telescope. And then we've had some um, uh, minor other instrumentation. So this uh, upper right is like a uh, instrument for measuring the uh, turbulence inside the dome so that we can keep track of our dome seeing and further optimize how we opti optimize the system. Um, the Oxtel spectrograph has been installed. That was part of that, that system test that I mentioned earlier. Um, we are getting data from it and um, uh, Merlin, uh, in company, including Robert uh, Lupton, are actively working on the software to analyze the data. But um, right now, the performance looks uh, looks good, and there's still some. I think technically, um, I would call the system operational. I think the next step for this uh, system is extracting the spectra and then converting those spectra into uh, the calibration data product of the atmospheric transmission function that we're, we're, we're seeking. Um, other integration activities um, here in Tucson, we had a, a, an extended effort for getting the, the ComCam system put together. Uh, we brought in some of the Slack personnel. Uh, we got ComCam fully tested here in Tucson. I mentioned this um, uh, system integration test exercise that we had in Chile at the end of the calendar year. Uh, that's the lower left panel. What's interesting here is that um, simultaneously uh, during that time period, we had uh, the secondary mirror M2 undergoing its functional testing. We had M1, M3 undergoing its functional testing. And then we had an integrated test of the camera cable wrap and the hexapod rotator all happening simultaneously at level three, which um, to me is really um, exciting because it, it indicates a level of maturity of operations at the summit facility um, that is uh, necessary for us to, to, to get us through this thing. So, and then lastly, um, also at the same time, uh, we were able to get the um, uh, compressor cabinets for the refrigeration pathfinder uh, for the camera installed and and tested as well. So um, I guess the, the message on this chart is that, you know, we had a, the, 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 the velocity on the project was all the way through the first part of uh, 2020 was really quite excellent and really exciting. And, you know, I think a challenge for us is going to be is to, um, uh, restart that velocity and pick it back up. So this was um, our uh, system integration test uh, exercise number one, where we were testing um, the hexapod rotator 
and the camo cable wrap on the cart. So this is this is this is the actual assembly that will go on the telescope that will ultimately it'll first support ComCam and then it will also then ultimate, ultimately support the uh, science camera. So we're doing this now so that um, and early so that we have time to get uh, the software uh, uh, integrated fully so that we don't have to try to do that while we're on the telescope. So we're taking advantage of some of this, this pause and delay to get some of the software work done. Um, here's a, a, a summary of ComCam in Tucson. We completed the work um, in right at, where was, when was that? It was uh, right at the beginning of March. And then we packed it up and we, we shipped it down to Chile. And so here's the, our, our EPO team having a selfie with um, ComCam just before it got disassembled. And I think the thing I really wanna point out here with ComCam is the, the right-hand two images. This is a, a selfie of Brian Stalder through a pinhole. And the upper image is uh, the raw image. And you can see all the different bias levels of the individual amplifiers. But after some just very minimal instrument signature removal processing, which is the lower image, um, you can see that the, the quality of the ComCam images are, is quite high. Um, they're, the raft that we have in ComCam is nearly science quality. It doesn't quite meet the science specs 100%, but it is close enough that it'll serve as a spare uh, for the science camera when we go into operations. But this is really good because that so that when we do go on sky with ComCam, we'll be able to get some really good data and really do some um, good testing, um, both technically and in the scientific uh, pipeline aspects. So as I mentioned, uh, ComCam has been shipped. It's in Chile now. Um, because the summit was closed down, um, we set it up in the um, the data center computer room. So that's what you see here is that ComCam is um, uh, configured, it's operational, it's running, it's been fully functionally tested. And so it's to the point now that we have an upcoming um, uh, operations rehearsal um, that ComCam will serve as a, a component of that operations rehearsal where we pretend to observe with ComCam in Chile and uh, ship the data all the way through our systems to NCSA. We bring it up live onto the uh, science platform and we start processing it. So that's that's scheduled to ha that rehearsal is scheduled for the first week of June. Um, and then I think yeah, so so this is uh, uh, an operational image from uh, Chile of ComCam. I think this chart just says what exactly what I just said now, so I won't dwell on it because I know we're getting short on time. Um, and then um, the last few charts are on EPO. Unfortunately, I'm not a uh, expert on EPO. I know EPO has been um, uh, making a lot of progress um, uh, in their four principal areas in, in the education, citizen science, general public. Um, they've been working on um, tooling for uh, investigating time domain astrophysics for those various audience. They've added staff over the last several months and I think um, Jelko you might correct me that I think they're fully staffed now I don't think there's any open positions uh, presently uh, on EPO I believe and so. oops wrong direction so um, they've been prototyping some some uh, tools for um, public interaction and this is an example of uh, uh, a tool that they're prototyping for uh, developing, uh, you know, exploring supernovae and then uh, taking the data that, that we get from our alert processing, um, fitting a curve to, to the, 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 or fitting a, you know, the, a model to the 
uh, light profile curve and then being able to put it onto a Hubble diagram. And that's my summary for today. So um, I know I probably skipped over a bunch of stuff, but thank you so much. Uh, I wanna I wanna state that the progress is tremendous and it's really great for us to be able to hear a comprehensive um, a comprehensive summary of all the all the incredible milestones and you know, hang in there with the COVID, like we all do. I had one question. I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, I'll ask mine if anybody else has um, questions. At this point, you don't need to type them anymore, so jump in right after this one, which is, so you mentioned that it's the first time that you are able to measure the seeing at sight. I assume that means like the scenes consistently overnight, etc. So if there are any changes from the historical scene records, would those have to be integrated in the op scenes or are they expected to be minor and below the level of detail that the op scene provides? So there's been, so um, we, we haven't had the, um, the on-site DIM operating consistently or long enough to make that evaluation directly. Um, Jelko can comment, but um, there's been some analysis of the DIM data. So, so just for everyone's background, the DIM measures the, the integrated turbulence from the, the top of the DIM tower all the way up through the, the top of the atmosphere. So it's really a better to think of it as a, as a turbulence monitor. Um, and you convert that into a freed parameter, R0, which you can then infer from that a full width half max, but then there's there's a bunch of caveats in terms of, you know, the impact of outer scale, how that outer scale is gets sampled by an aperture, but in any event, um, uh, I, I, Joko, remind me of the fellow's name that did the analysis, um, but there, there's been some analysis done of the, the record of the dim data from Gemini that show that there, there has been a trend, there, there has been some differences. And go ahead, Joko. It was Eric Nielsen from Fermilab, but I'll have to leave you for another telecon. Okay. The last one, please turn the lights off in my blue jeans. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> All right. See you, Joko. So, Federica, what, what I think um, uh, Eric's analysis showed was that there has been some secular uh, degradation to the scene. And more, I think. Interestingly enough, um, he was showing that there's some correlation between the um, the uh, El Nino La Nina cycle um, in the weather pattern on the uh, on the scene. I don't re exactly remember which direction the correlation goes, but you can see a periodic pattern um, that correlates with with the the, the Enso uh, cycle. You're muted. I mute. Sorry, I am muted. Um, the op scenes must be based on historical scene data, right? So this might have implication on the simulations that we receive. Yeah. So so op sim is is it either has or is updating. Um, it's seeing model uh, okay. to the, this current analysis. So the, the original seeing model is one that I did back in oh, 2005, 2006. Um, and I, 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 I think there is some, some change and I think it, um, Jelka would know better than I right now, but I, I think it's, you know, it's, it's of order a 10% effect. Oh, wow. okay. Interesting. It will be interesting to see that. Um, I think we're losing most of the project participants because I think they have a call. But uh, the science collaborations are still here. Does anybody have um, questions for chat? Um, okay. I have one. Thank you. I was just curious, what's the next hurdle? You talked a lot about what's been done. 
but if you just so assuming you get back up and running, you know, in a hopefully sooner rather than later, what's the next big thing that has to get done? Or I guess is sort of in your milestones, what are the next three that you're thinking about um, that you haven't touched on yet? Well, I, I think you know the, the the first two I think are are pretty obvious, right? It's it's um, completion of the dome, and there's many sub milestones that are related to that. Um, it's also then the completion of the telescope mount assembly. So those are those are the two obvious ones, you know, at least in my mind. Uh, and then, um, but you know, th those are. Um, those are contracted efforts. So those are reliant, meeting those milestones is reliant on um, our, our contractors. For us internally, um, I think the next big milestone is um, Sandrine and company are planning. So you saw that one picture I showed of all those components, the M2, the M1, M3, the hexapod rotator all sitting at um, level three. And uh, we're planning on conducting, so we've tested each one of those components sort of independently and individually. So the next big milestone there is to bring those together all as a single integrated system and test them, do an integrated test of all of those operating simultaneously with each other rather than individually. Um, and I think one of the other big milestones for us. I guess the other big milestone in my mind um, that we need to is getting getting ComCam up from La Serena to the summit facility. And it's not so much ComCam itself per se, but the it's the related component that goes with it is the refrigeration pathfinder. I think getting the refrigeration pathfinder started is also a major thing that we want to get started as soon as we possibly can. If that answers your question. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Any other questions? We are just at the top of the hour. So if there are no pressing questions. Thanks again, Chuck. This was great. Um, and chairs, I will let you know what we arrange for next month. Um, typically, we don't have a call in July, but we do have one in June, so I expect we'll organize one for the next month. And also remember that um, I need some feedback on what to propose for the PCW splinter sessions. There is an email thread on that. So if you have thoughts, um, please contribute to that email thread. And then, uh, Fed, thank you for giving yes. me the opportunity to share uh, with the uh, science chairs. No, uh, I, and I really appreciate it because, of course, COVID makes you all even busier than before. So we, uh, in the name of all the chairs, uh, we appreciate the project time to let us know what's going on in detail. My pleasure. Thanks, everybody.